All right, good morning. How's everybody doing? Good morning. <laughs> All right, hi guys. Thanks for coming to University of Montana today. So this is our, our 13th annual. Actually, the one's supposed to say uh, unlucky number 13. So this is between our 12th and our 14th annual symposium today. So thank you very much for coming. Uh, we have lots of presentations for you, lots of posters to get through. But before we do that, there's just a couple of announcements that I'd like to make. So maybe the most important thing that you learned today is where the bathrooms are. So just right there to the, uh, to the right of the guys and right there to the left of the girls. So there's a bunch of posters that, uh, that, are, that we have, over 50 posters that uh, were brought today. So if you have a poster and you haven't put it, put it up yet, uh, see Carolyn or Naomi or Earl, that uh, Earl can help too. So if you have a poster, see Earl right there with his hand up. That's Dr. Earl Adams. So we have MCAT here today, so they're going to be filming this whole presentation. So there's Ron in the back of the room. So everybody say hi to Ron. Hi, Ron. Hi, Ron. So this, present, this whole uh, symposium will be recorded and, uh, and presented in a, in a week or so on MCAT. So when you least expect it, uh, you might be on camera because we're also going to have phot photographers floating around and taking pictures of you guys too. So always have a bright, sunny uh, smile on your face. And then be sure and check out the uh, admissions tables out there if you're interested in going to University of Montana. We'd be happy to talk to you. And uh, so there's uh, uh, admissions tables out there if you want more information about coming to UM next year or the year after. So it'll be kind of fast and furious once we get started today. Um, we have, I think, 14 presentations. And we're going to start in just a few minutes with the first nine and try to get through those. And then we're going to have a 30-minute uh, poster viewing session. So all the, the teachers uh, will uh, escort you out there. And your job is to look at all the posters. And there's going to be a test on all the material after it's over. Right, Dave? Brock, OK. So, but I think the people that did the posters would be super happy about you guys looking at the posters and asking uh, them questions about their work. So please do that, because they put a lot of time and effort into your posters, right? So um, after that, we're going to come back in here and do uh, five more presentations, then do lunch, do some quick evaluations, and then we're going to give away some prizes, which is always the fun part of the ceremony. So we have about uh, 50 to 60 posters this year, which is a record number for us. And there's a whole bunch of people that are out there judging your posters right now. I think there's 10 or so people that, that are out there. The poster judging actually started last Friday, uh, last Thursday, actually. So there's so many posters. But they're finishing up right now with all the posters that just came today. So at 11 o'clock, we're going to release you. And then for 30 minutes, we're going to have a poster viewing session. So be sure and check out those posters. And then later on, we're going to call specific names, and we're going to ask you guys to go stand by your posters, and you're going to be interviewed by judges. So more information on that is to come. So the top three posters uh, that are award awarded the first, uh, first, second, and third prizes actually get uh, gift cards to the University of Montana Bookstore. So those include uh, $50 for third place, $75 for second, and $100 for first place. Actually, I think it's just a Visa gift card. It's not a uh, UM Bookstore. So Visa gift card. So for presentations, again, we have 14. And we are going to randomly draw what the presentations are. Uh, you'll have five minutes for those that are, that are coming up here. And um, five minutes for presentations. And I'll, you'll talk into the microphone. I'll show you how to scroll uh, through the slides. At five minutes, the lights will come on. And then you'll have a minute or two of questions and answers. So um, we really encourage questions uh, from the audience um, and then from the judging panel as well. Top three presentations will be graded and awarded by your judging uh, panel. Uh, first, second, and third prizes. So third prize is $100. Second prize is $125. Third prize is a, our first prize is a $150 gift card. So with that, I'd like to introduce your judging panel that uh, will be evaluating your presentations. So first off, I'd like to introduce Amy Sillenberg, who is the director of Climate Smart Missoula. <laughs> so that's a good start, because you want to keep your judges very happy, because they're going to be evaluating your presentations. Holly Truitt is not here. Uh, ben Schmidt. So Ben Schmidt works at the Missoula Health Department. 
anytime there's like a forest fire or air quality inversion, Ben is always the guy on, on TV talking about how bad our air quality is here in Missoula. Uh, Mary French, staff scientist with the Center for Environmental Sciences. Laura Staples, news anchor for KECI. And then Dr. Fernando Cardozo, uh, professor in biomedical pharmaceutical sciences. All right, so with that, I think it's ready, to, uh, it's go time. We're ready to get started. So what we're gonna do now is pull up the first presentation. So when I call your name, try to get down here as quickly as you can. Or when I pull up your presentation, try to come down here as quickly as you can. Hi there, my name is Andy, and this is Cody, and this is Shantae, and our title is pretty simple, weather and radon. We didn't know what else to call it just because those are our two variables. We're from Big Sky High School, and we'll start if everybody's ready. All right, so the first important thing to realize is why we chose weather as our radon variable. The main reason why is because weather changes from minute to minute. I'm sure everybody's heard the phrase, if you don't like the weather, wait five minutes and it'll change. Well, this can actually have drastic effects within a house. Imagine if you're snowed in and you can't get out. And what if you already know that you have a history of radon detection within your house? Well, if weather affects radon, then it could be even higher. Or if you're lucky, it could be even lower. We'll talk about that in just a second. Weather is also very well documented to affect radon. But the problem is, is that we're still very iffy about you know, which variable does which, all these kind of things. Of course, weather is a very complicated issue. And then finally, the change in pressure is another well-known thing. And we'll explain that again in just a second. All right, so the hypothesis that we came up with when we all had our you know, initial group four meeting, um, both air pressure and moisture will have an inverse effect on indoor radon emissions while temperature and wind will have positive effects on emissions. So basically, uh, air pressure and moisture, if those go higher, radon uh, emissions will go lower, and then temperature and wind, if those go higher, so will radon. Our testing method was quite simple. We took two radon detectors that have a uh, data period of 48 hours, and then we staggered them 24 hours apart so we could effectively get each day difference. Um, and then we just took you know, the CPI per liter that it presented and then just input it into a couple of graphs. So here's our raw data. It's pretty standard. We had three different weeks um, and just input all the different data. We already knew that this house had high data, high radon emissions before, so uh, everything's pretty much in the floors, which is, of course, quite concerning. All right, and here's all of our process. So what we did is we took uh, five different ones and we added precipitation and it just into the mix to see if anything was extremely out of the ordinary. And there's quite a lot of them. And this is the main problem with weather and radon is that there are so many different trends that you have to look at <laughs> that it's not very clear. But the ones that we started to see the most effects with are moisture and then over here in barometric pressure. You can see that in moisture, uh, if we look at test one, as moisture starts going up, radon starts going down, and the exact opposite. Test two was the outstanding factor, which is why we're still not quite sure about moisture in the ground. And then finally, with test three, it correlates quite nicely. Um, the problem with test two is not only that we did we have an insanely low uh, cold snap every night, but also then it was raining a lot. So, the problem could, of course, be affected by one of those variables. Um, with pressure, it's pretty standard. It's the, almost the exact same as moisture. When it goes up, radon emissions go down. Now, the main problem with our process data right now is that we, the main equations that are out there to help calculate this are way beyond, beyond the scope of a high school student. It's extremely advanced calculus, and we try to get help. And it's really hard to process it, surprisingly. And so I would, of course, like to invite anybody else who has greater knowledge of this to help us with it. But right now, we're mainly convinced that pressure and moisture have positive effects on radon. 
So our conclusion basically is that while radon shielding is pretty standard nowadays in housing, we obviously see that it's not effective against things like barometric pressure, moisture, and all those variables. And so what our conclusion came down to is that we really need to start looking into things that their permeability of radon isn't affected by these variables. Is that a, yeah, anything to say? Okay. And, Any questions? Okay. Oh, go ahead. Uh, which weather variable do you think is most impactful for us in Missoula? In Missoula, saying as we are in a valley, I would say that barometric pressure is constantly changing, and that's a big problem, especially during the summer when um, it's, it stands pretty low. We can see that radon emissions start getting higher and higher in the summer, but thankfully, temperature has an increased effect. Which of the variables uh, have great tests? Uh, our greatest effect is seen to be barometric pressure, as that was standard across all of the tests, whereas uh, the other ones that we hypothesized, like moisture during test two, got a bit funky. But barometric pressure stayed pretty well. How did you keep things like temperature and precipitation a constant? Um, we didn't use a constant within our test because our constant was the rate on emission and then compared it against the variability of weather. Um, we did compare it to a couple of constants that other people had within our school and found that there were no out, outstanding, sorry, there were no crazy outliers or anything like that. And so there was a lot of you know behind the scenes processing, but we don't have any constants. <coughs> Were tests one, two, and three all done in the same home? Yeah, they were all in the same home in the same exact location within that home. So, radon is different depending where you measure it in the home. Where did you choose to measure it? Uh, we chose to measure it as close to the ground within the house as possible. And we, uh, we also put it directly in the crawl space so it wouldn't have any indoor insulation shielding behind it. So we could try and get as close as possible. All right, thanks guys. I'm James Blavin, and this is my partner Samuel Daughtry. We are from Corvallis High School, and our teacher is Mr. Hamill. And we, our presentation is, does the OI on B1000 air purifier really purify air? Our experiment was, if an O-ion B1000 permanent filter ionic air purifier pro-ionizer with UVC sanitizer, yes, that's the actual name, if it can actually reduce the amount of PM2.5 <coughs> levels in the air. Our hypothesis was that the O-ion B1000 air purifier wouldn't be able to make a significant difference in the amount of levels of PM2.5 that it can reduce mainly because of the amount of air it can push out. You see, it's set up uh, about this big, and it has this little section where it can push out the air, and we don't think that it would be able to do that enough to purify an entire room. These are the, we chose two locations. One is in my dining room. So in that little red circle is where the air purifier is, and right there is where our Dylos air monitor was. And in relation to that, in the other picture is a wood stove that we used to heat our house. The other location we used was my bedroom. Right there is the air purifier, and then the Dylos monitor was set right there. And in this room is heated by a standard wall heater. The materials we used was the air purifier a dialos air monitor, and a humidity monitor. Our procedures. At around, in, in the evening, we turned on the dialos air monitor and monitored our air until morning. In that same morning, we turned on the air purifier and let it run uh, until the next morning. Uh, during the same evening that we had turned on the air purifier, we turned on the dialos in the evening, and then we let both of them run until the morning. And then we shut them both off, and we did the exact same procedures for the living room. The graphs that we have for the dining room show here. This little orange thing 
uh, line is our with the air purifier. We think this little spike right here could have been caused because of a family member opening up the door to our wood stove, releasing a bunch of smoke and messing with our Dylos air monitor. Um, and the green is without the uh, air purifier. This is my bedroom. The top line is without the air purifier and the bottom one is with the air purifier. And as you can see from this graph, it made quite a significant difference in a smaller area. Our conclusion was that our tests have shown that our hypothesis was incorrect and yet at the same time it was kind of correct. It doesn't make a huge significant difference in a bigger area. However, in a smaller area, it's more significant. And we believe that is because, you know, smaller area, there's less air that it needs to purify in the area it's in, basically. So bigger area doesn't do that much difference. Ways to improve, we could be testing for more than one day. We could have tested for more than one location. Testing with different heaters and testing within the same time period, meaning that like 20 minutes without the air purifier and then 20 minutes with the air purifier, so within the same time area. And questions? In the larger area, you said that you, they, you had that spike potentially from the wood stove door being open. Uh, did you think of trying to redo the test so you can get sort of a more comparable mm -hmm. run? Right, yeah. That's definitely something that we would do is uh, redoing it because, of course, that's a, that was a huge spike and it did mess with our experiment a little bit. But from uh, the time it was able to get that down into a more reasonable area after a kind of short amount of time. So yep. then was that spike with or without the air purifier? That spike was uh, with the air purifier. So that, that one seemed to be higher than that. Mm -hmm. And we, we believe it was because uh, those were taken at different times. One was taken the day before, and we believe the spike was just my, my dad or my mom or my sister, someone of a family member opening up the door of our wood stove. So my main question would be, would that actually indicate that it did have an impact on a large area because you took the spike and brought it down? <laughs> yeah, that was definitely one of the things we thought of was that it did, it did help. We just don't know if it helped significantly to the point. Okay, pretty good, okay. All right, so my name is Brennan Murphy. I'm from Sentinel High School, and my chemistry teacher is Mr. Taylor. And, um, for my experiment, I was testing if there was a difference in carbon monoxide emissions between a diesel field engine and a gas field engine. And project summary was just to, once again, determine if there is a significant difference between the two types of fuel. And the gas engine I was using was a 1999 Ford F-150 with a 4.6 liter V8 with 281 cubic inches of displacement. The diesel field engine was a 1999 Ford Power Stroke 7.3 with 444 cubic inches of displacement. And since diesels are kind of becoming more popular, it's important to determine whether or not their emissions are more harmful. And so this is the four stroke engine cycle for a diesel versus gas. They're both pretty much the same, except diesels don't have spark plugs. Instead, um, they have the same intake stroke, same compression stroke, but on the power stroke, they, diesels have a much higher compression ratio, so they don't need a spark plug to ignite. There's enough um, pressure causing the heat that'll ignite on its own without uh, a spark plug compared to while gas engines need a spark plug. And yeah, the exhaust stroke is the same. And a little bit more background information. Um, diesels are becoming more popular, but there's still 95% of cars on the roads today are gas fueled engines. And um, some of the health effects to um, diesels are 
prolonged exposure to them can cause death, but even like a little bit, it'll cause nausea, headaches, dizziness, all that sort of stuff. And yeah, there's some more foam on that. And my hypothesis is that diesels will produce less carbon monoxide since they undergo compression ignition. Since they don't have spark plugs, I think this, having spark plugs will add a little bit of um, carbon monoxide to the exhaust. And drove both trucks into the garage and just to kind of avoid outside contamination. Then took some baseline data to um, make sure there wasn't any carbon monoxide in the garage when we took the test and um, used the carbon monoxide data logger 20 centimeters away from the tailpipe. And um, in between trials, the garage was fan, fanned out to kind of get all that residual carbon monoxide out of there before they started the next trial. And both of them were at normal idling RPMs. And my data collected showed a statistically significant difference between the gas fueled engine and the diesel fueled engine, with the diesel fueled engine being significantly, producing significantly less carbon monoxide than the gas fueled engine did, which they, since they had different engine sizes, I standardized them and made it so it's parts per million per liter, so it would even it out a little bit. And yeah, once again, my, the hypothesis staying since diesel undergo compression ignition, they'll produce a lot less carbon monoxide than gas fuel engines was backed up by the data. And um, yeah, so some other tests could be performed to see if there's any other, any other differences with their emissions, like PM 2.5 and all that good stuff. And some sources. And Yep, any questions? So can you go back to your data slide? Yes. <laughs> so the 35.3 and 21.7, are those averages from multiple tests? Or yeah. Just one test? that, yeah, it's an average of. How many tests did you do? Um, just one test for each um, for, five minute, for a five minute period of the truck's idling. So, but what's the observations 30 then? Oh, that's how many, so the little carbon monoxide reader I have, it um, took a, it was, it like kind of took a reading every, I think it was three seconds or so. So that's kind of, that's how many, um, look, that's how many readings it took for each of them. But, but each were just tested once, is that what yeah. you're saying? So the 35 is just the one carbon monoxide data point? No, that's, that's, well, that's a me mean average of all of them. Uh, but over the five. Yeah, over okay. five minutes. But over the 30 observations, right? They weren't done multiple testing. Times. No. Okay. So, which one will give you better mileage to the, the drugs? The gas uh, if you're going for gas mileage, diesels will give you a lot better MPG. So, you expected to use the mileage, using that data, the, the, the consumption of gasoline or diesel, what would you expect which one would be better? If you're, are you asking like which will get better miles to the gallon? And based on the on the production of carbon monoxide. I mean, yeah, diesels. Would be even better. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, do you think whether like uh, promoting either a carburetor or a throttle body would affect like it's, you know, exhaust? I mean, it could. I'm not, I don't really think it would do too much. To, too much of an extent to exhaust. All right, thank you. Right. Hello, I am Brian Healy from Kerr Alice High School. My chemistry teacher is Mr. Hamill. And the question I wanted to answer for my experiment was uh, the effect of elevation on Missoula's air quality. So uh, I decided to hike Mount Sentinel with my dad and with an air quality monitor to find out how elevation affected air quality. Uh, my hypothesis was that as elevation increased, levels of, of PM 2.5 particles would decrease because the 
unclean air produced by Missoula and produced around Missoula would stay near the ground and hiking up a mountain would kind of escape that. So for my method, um, I needed to hike Mount Sentinel with or while continuously re recording elevation and PM 2.5 levels. So I needed uh, the small air quality monitor in the bottom left there designed by my teacher, Mr. Hamill, and I needed uh, a power bank to power it, a phone for a mobile hotspot, and a watch that can record elevation. So my dad and I hiked Mount Sentinel with a lot of cables and stuff so that I could record elevation and uh, air quality in tandem, and that worked pretty well and I got some data. So these graphs show the change in elevation and the change in PM 2.5 levels in micrograms per meter cubed over time. And as you can see, as elevation goes down, the levels of PM 2.5 go up. While, although the uh, levels of PM 2.5 are also very erratic, the dotted line shows the average not line or average amount, but uh, I assume that the sporadicness of the air quality was caused by dust being kicked up from us hiking on the trail. So that, but that was evenly dispersed over the entire hike. So the general trend still holds true. So I generally discovered that. Uh, as elevation decreased, the air quality worsened. Or so my hypothesis held true that the bad air produced by Missoula stays near Missoula. Although the air quality was startlingly bad for the whole hike, sometimes spiking up into 400 micrograms per meter cubed. So it, it, the lower you are in the Missoula Valley, you have worse air quality. And if I was to do this again, I would uh, put some cloth or something protective in front of the monitor so as to try to keep away the dust kicked up from hiking. And I would hike a couple times in a couple days to get a larger and more accurate data range. And thanks to my dad. Any questions? Yes. Uh, they were, or, so the, uh, uh, the, uh, like, average healthy air quality is considered to be 35 uh, micrograms per meter cubed, and throughout that hike, it was never that low, because it, it was just spiking a ton, I assume, from the dust kicked up by the hike. Do you feel as though that walking with the detector in hand on the hike with a scooter made your data a little more I feel like it was all right aside from dust, but we probably could have gotten more accurate readings if we just stopped at certain elevations along Mount Sentinel and just ran it for a while. But I think it was all right. What time of the year was this done? Uh, this was spring. Yeah, it was a couple, it was like a month or two ago. Did you compare your results to standard air measurements that are taken in Missoula, you know, at the valley floor? I didn't. What do you think of the plan cover of the mountain? Well, most of that hike is pretty open and barren, so I feel like if there were more trees that could have helped the air quality, but there weren't really, so. If it makes you feel any better, um, whatever you kicked up, chances of it being PM 2.5, because I believe you said your monitor is a PM 2.5 yeah. monitor, is going to be quite a bit larger than 2.5 microns across. Yeah. Uh, combustion sources are the primary source for anything of that size range, that 0 to 2.5. Uh, when you get larger, that's where you start getting more crustal, tire wear, and dust. 
Okay. So I don't think that really affected your results, the hiking. Oh, that's good. <laughs> All right. Anybody else? <laughs> Thank you. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Logan Christensen. This is my partner, Virgil Sadewasser. And the focus of our research project, project was the production of carbon monoxide during combustion of wood based on moisture content. We're from Libby High School. Our teacher is Mrs. Rose. What is carbon monoxide? Carbon monoxide is an odorless, colorless, poisonous, and tasteless gas. It comes from the incomplete combustion of a fuel source, such as burning wood or gasoline. Um, carbon monoxide can cause hypoxia, which kills brain cells and tissue cells. It binds to hemoglobin and prevents oxygen from attaching. The purpose of our experiment. We conducted this research to find out if the moisture content would affect the levels of carbon monoxide production. This is relevant to the Libby area because many of our residents use wood heating to heat their homes during the cold winter months. If, if uh, what wood really does produce more carbon monoxide, it could uh, be dangerous to continue burning unseasoned, undried wood. For our experiment design, we used the Alaska Electronics Carbon Monoxide Sensor with a laptop to record our readings. We used a mini ligno moisture detector uh, to take uh, the readings of the moisture content in the wood. We used a notepad and pen to manually know our data until we could get it organized digitally. And we used a we used our furnace constructed of aluminum and, uh, and a pie tin at the bottom. So what we did here was we put a... Okay, so for the opening of the uh, foil, that's where we put the wood at. And then uh, at the top of it, once we uh, hold the blowtorch near the opening to get the wood to catch fire, we'd hold them the moisture or the um, carbon monoxide detector above the furnace to take the readings of what uh, of the ppm that we were that we were receiving on the moisture meter there was two prongs on the end of it that were inserted into a block of wood that gave the moisture content of 8% 10% and so on her procedure we cut down 40 pieces of pine to 2 inch by 4 and a half by 3 quarter inch blocks each block was labeled with the number 1 through 8 there were five trials with eight blocks in each leading to 40 pieces total. Each of the blocks were soaked for the amount of time to achieve the desired moisture content. Shown on this table, the pieces, piece one was soaked for zero minutes. This was our control. It started at 8% moisture, soaking all the way up through, through 105 minutes for a 22% moisture content. We set up a laptop and other needed safety equipment. We had fire extinguishers, a fan to blow out the carbon monoxide in between tests, and a bucket of water in case the burning got out of control. So we, for the beginning of the trial, we set up the carbon monoxide detector, started burning for one minute, let the wood smolder for one, one minute to release smoke into the detector, and the trial was complete. This was done with all 40 samples. We hypothesized that wood with a higher moisture content would re release more carbon monoxide into the air. We thought this because carbon monoxide is produced from the incomplete combustion of a fuel source, and we inferred that the moisture in the wood would create a poor burning environment, which it did. So this was the data table I talked about already. It showed that the pieces were soaked, and the longer they were soaked, the more moisture content they picked up, which was measured by the meter to get an accurate reading. This table shows the uh, the pieces of wood and their readings of carbon monoxide levels that we received with our uh, detector. So as you can see from this, our first piece throughout the trial, that was our control that had 8% moisture content, had the least levels of carbon monoxide detected. Whereas our uh, number eight had the highest levels of CO2 detected, or of carbon monoxide detected, and that was the highest moisture content content. We did have an outlier in trial one. The readings were taken were 343 and a half parts per million of carbon monoxide. This is almost 100 more than the other trials. So we did not include this outlier because we did not feel it would give an accurate representation of the data we collected. 
and so we excluded it from our mean results as shown here. These results were the average of the five trials combined into one graph. And so as you can see, there's a steady correlation between the increase of moisture content and the increase, increase of carbon monoxide produced. For analysis, our data that we collected, as we've shown you guys, the higher the moisture content we had, the more, or the higher the levels of carbon monoxide, which, support, which supports our hypothesis that um, wood with the higher moisture content would produce uh, more parts per million of carbon monoxide. Um, I, if you guys noticed, because uh, we didn't explain it earlier, but for trials six and seven, we had, they were very close together. We believe that, uh, we believe this was caused because the moisture in the blocks was unevenly distributed. So we put the moisture meter in, it got a reading of 18%, but I believe that it was closer to 20% in both trials. And so it was essentially burning um, six blocks at 20% moisture, which led to producing the same amounts of carbon monoxide in all six trials. For possible sources of air, there was some human air. We may have held the blowtorch at varying lengths from the wood when we were burning it, or when we were cutting the blocks, the measurements may have been imprecise, leading to different volumes, which would have soaked up different amounts of moisture. There may have been lingering carbon monoxide in the garage in between testing, and because we might not have blown it all out with the fan shown there. And then some carbon monoxide may have escaped from the furnace through the opening in the front instead of out the chimney as intended. Um, although unlikely, the carbon monoxide monitor may have taken incorrect readings. And as previously mentioned, there may have been an uneven moisture distribution in the blocks of wood. Our, uh, for the outlier, we believe the outlier was caused because we held the we held the blowtorch too close to the piece of wood that would cause the um, that would accelerate the process that would accelerate the process of the wood burning. The um, combustion process would speed up, thus causing more um, higher levels of ppm at that moment. For our conclusion, our our hypothesis was supported. We. Our mo the more moisture content we had in the wood, the higher levels of carbon monoxide we received. Our purpose was validated, and for people in the Liv Libby area and er everywhere else around the world, you should not burn wet wood, because wet wood can cause this carbon monoxide to get into your houses and cause carbon monoxide poisoning and eventually can kill you. So, <laughs> so in the end, we should season and dryer wood before we burn it. And these are the sources that we use. Thank you for your time, ladies and gentlemen. We will now take questions. <laughs> In the garage, yeah, we took baseline levels. It started at about 10 parts per million on average. And so the levels we did take were increases from that. I'm wondering if other people have found this similar pattern. Have other people tested it, or is this very new research? Yeah, after we conducted our research, we looked it up, and it was shown that when burning uh, wet wood, it was recommended that it was in a well-ventilated area because it was proven that carbon monoxide did build up from uh, unseasoned wood being burned. Any further questions? All right, thank you. Thank you. Big Sky High School, and we're in IV Biology and Chemistry, Mr. Uh, Jones and Mr. Ferder. And our question that we decided to investigate was, does smoking outside uh, a home, just outside the home, does that reduce the PM 2.5 levels inside the home? Okay. So just as Betta just stated, our research question is, does going outside and smoking your cigarette um, reduce the PM 2.5 levels within your house? And so the reason why we chose this topic is due to the fact that out of, we had another person, but out of our entire group that we had, uh, my family is the only family that actually smoked. And so with the fact that um, smoking 
inside of a house or smoking at all. Everybody talks about secondhand smoke and why it's so bad for you. And so it's like, does actually going outside and smoking outside, it, does that actually, is that gonna reduce smoking within your house? Because my family, they've been smoking for a really long time and my parents always go outside and they smoke out there and it's kind of like, hey, are you actually doing any good for me or is it still making a bad difference? And so our hypothesis is smoking outdoors will result in a, a lower PM2.5 level. That's due to the fact that it's not in a confined area and you have your wind and it's to push it away and it's not within your house and not just confining it and not getting blown through your ventilation system and just going throughout your house and whatnot. So, yeah. All right, so we thought we'd give a little background on PM2.5. Um, so for those of you guys who don't know, uh, PM2.5 refers to any small particles that are uh, 2.5 microns in diameter. So they're very small particles. Um, and they're usually released um, in a home from anything like smoking cigarettes, cooking, uh, air freshening, uh, burning candles, uh, vacuuming, anything that releases small particles in the air. And they can actually be quite harmful um, to your health. Um, they can get into your lungs and cause a number of diseases, uh, particularly asthma, um, and they can have some long-term fatal health effects. Um, one of the uh, bits of research we found that average PM2.5 levels for a home that has smoking inside in America is 138 micrograms uh, per uh, meters cubed. And if you look here, this is uh, air quality index, and this 138 uh, microns falls in the uh, very unhealthy uh, air quality range. Can I step Okay, and so if you guys don't know, like during the burning season when we have all of our fires and whatnot in Montana, usually the particulate matter is either in the red or it is in the purple on that chart up there, which is where the average smoking house is. So basically if you smoke in your house and don't go outside or don't do anything with just smoking in your house, you are basically having the same um, air quality as a forest fire within your backyard, but it's inside your house. And so what we did is we took, originally we were gonna have three different houses, but it went down to two houses. But what we did is we took three um, of these Dylos logger air monitors and we put them throughout um, our houses. We had one right outside, the, outside, like right by a door to measure what the particulate matter is outside and what it is like when the door is open and see if that alters anything. We had one within the kitchen, that way we can monitor because if you think about it in your kitchen, you have, you're cooking your food and it, steam comes off and that's, that source of steam is also releasing particulate matter. You have your sweeping and you're just, you're, it's just kind of shows a little bit of an outlier thing within your house. And then we had one somewhere within the house that doesn't really have all too much activity just to measure the, um, how much, like just a, not really an activeness, so like just the particulate matter that's not floating around as much, it's not kicked up, and so we just kind of use that as a constant for the entire house a little bit. And so we took it and we collected data from, from about 24 hours to 48 hours. It's a little bit of a stretch, but with we, yeah, that's about it. Okay. And so here's our, uh, here's our data. Um, we found that um, here, uh, so our orange bars here is the home where smoking occurs just outside the door. And blue is uh, a non-smoking home where um, we used it as a control trial. And so you can see that uh, the kitchen, uh, obviously it's interesting to note that in the non-smoking home, the kitchen actually had worse air quality. Um, and kitchens usually have typically bad air quality anyway because of uh, all the cooking and stuff that goes on. Um, the living room is about the same, but you can notice here that outdoors, the home where smoking occurred just outside the door, the air quality was uh, significantly worse. And we can correlate that to the fact that smoking is occurring there. Um, we also put on this graph so you guys can see the uh, limit for uh, uh, healthy air quality is around 50 micrograms per meter cubed. And so um, even within a home that doesn't have smoking, there's still um, unhealthy air quality that occurs. But um, 
the where the smoking occurred outside uh, that was significantly higher it was around 300 micrograms per meter cubed. And this red line is the average uh, PO2.5 levels in a home where smoking occurs inside normally. And so um, where the smoking was occurring outside, you can see that it was uh, significantly beyond that level. Um, so it was unhealthy in that area, but it seems like it didn't carry over into the rest of the house. Okay. So our conclusion supported our hypothesis. Um, if you go outside and you smoke a cigarette, uh, the wind or the moisture or whatever is actually outside that is a variable of the weather, it can push that particulate matter away from your house and it's not going to get sucked back into your house and it's not going to just sit inside of your house and circulate through your air vents and just be there. And so if you are going to smoke and you are going to have kids or a family, go outside and smoke. Other don't recommend smoking, but if you are, it's better to smoke outside. It's better for your health and it's better for not necessarily the environment, but just your house. And um, even non smoking homes, like in Montana itself, we have really bad quality because it's outdoors and everything. This is our references. Time for one or two questions. Um, when the, my parents go out and smoke, they just open up the door and they stand there and they smoke their cigarette and what we can see is that the weather itself pushes, kind of seems to push it away just due to the size of the actual particle is probably why. Usually it was just inside the door or just right on the back porch. The monitor, we got our doors right here and we have a little um, cabinet thing outside on our back porch and I just put it right next to the door. That way if they usually just smoke right on outside the door or right inside of the door. So, yeah. So I actually think this is a very interesting study you guys are doing because there are people that do very similar studies but they look for other things rather than 2 be 2.5. Have you come to a literature or something that you say, oh, this would be interesting for looking at? Yeah, we were actually, uh, our one of the topics of our study we were doing in our class was PM 2.5, and we thought it would be interesting to investigate. We did find some literature um, on that, that uh, cigarettes are actually a large producer of PM 2.5, um, and they, uh, yeah, can have a lot of really bad health effects, so we want to look into that. All right. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Hunter Lyon, and this is Kendra Barker. We're from Central High School. And from Central High School, we're currently taking the Chemistry 2 class under the direction of our teacher, Brett Taylor. So we wanted to answer whether or not there is a difference between levels of PM 2.5 between feeding cows grain and hay. So we hypothesized that two 33-pound flakes of hay would release more PM 2.5 particulates than 45 pounds of grain. Um, so for some background, um, agriculture is the number one industry in Montana and it produces, um, it gets a lot of money, as you can see. Um, we wanted to know if there was an issue with PM 2.5 um, while ranchers are feeding. Um, since there are twice as many cows as there are people, there could be a huge impact. Um, and they could, if we could, they could protect themselves more, then they could lessen their exposure. Um, so we use the dialos to collect our data. Uh, we had our, this is called a pole barn, and we had our monitor set up about like six feet away from where we were fed. Um, and we compared our data using an unpaired t-test. All right, so for the procedure. So we conducted the tests on non-windy days without precipitations, and that was around three grain tests and three hay tests. 
So we fed the hay and grain separately to three cows within the pole barn. Uh, da, da, da. And we uh, fed two 33-pound flakes of hay to these cows and 45 pounds of grain to these cows. So we set up the dilos 30 minutes prior to feeding so we can get a baseline to see what would be. We'd spend around five minutes actually feeding the grain hay to the cows, and then we'd let the dilos run for an additional 30 minutes. And here you can see a graph of uh, the time lapse of hay and grain. So the blue line represents the grain, and the orange line represents the hay. So over, uh, you can see that the hay tended to hit a higher spike in the very beginning, or I mean the grain, as opposed to the hay. And, but overall, hay had, near the end, was a bit higher than the grain. <coughs> All right. And so for the results, as said earlier, we used an unpaired t-test to find out the uh, average mean between the two different samples. And we found out through a p 2 tail uh, data that there is no significant difference between particulates released between hay and grain. Um, since there was no significant difference in our data, we accepted our null hypothesis and rejected our predicted hypothesis. Um, we ran into quite a few obstacles when we were doing our experiments. Um, at the very beginning, we started with 30 cows, but we had to cut it down to three to get a more controlled um, data, to control our data more. Um, and we also didn't use the same amount of hay and grain at the beginning. Um, and so we had to like, kind of figure out how to measure our um, hay and grain to get an equal amount. Um, our environment also could have been more controlled and we could have done it in a enclosed area that we could get more particulates to go through. Um, and we think that if we had a large amount of cows, we could have seen more of a difference between the hay and grain. So. And here are some of the sources we used. Mm -hmm. so, Any questions? Yeah. <laughs> When did the testing start? When you like took the hay from the pole barn, when you dumped the grain into the thing? Yeah, kind of um, we, what time was being measured? So we got a baseline that, so we started it with 30 minutes for a baseline, and then we would feed, which usually took like 10 minutes when we both were able to feed. Um, and then we let it run for about another half hour, and then we would get, collect our data from then. So all in all, it was like an hour and 10 minutes to do the whole experiment. Yeah. That, that sort of confused me, though, that one spike. Yeah. The beginning should be for the grain and the hay, then from my understanding, should be pretty similar. Mm -hmm. And you didn't see anything or observe anything to get that spike at the beginning? Um, we might have skewed it a little bit, like stepping in front of it and moving um, where the hay, like the, because on the ground there was lots of hay as well. So we could have like skewed it a little bit by messing with the hay on the ground or the grain on the ground. Did you guys know how much 2.5 is in the hay and the grain before or anything? Uh, we did not know how much was in before, so yeah. Any more questions? Improving Athletes Air Quality. I'm Norris Blossom, this is Gage Luru, and this is John Luru. We are taught by Sarah Urban at Capitol High School. So the question we wanted to pose was, do different running surfaces produce different amounts of particulate 2.5 matter? And uh, the hypothesis we came up with for this, so we decided that uh, different running surfaces will produce different PM 2.5 levels. So we found that athletes put themselves and their lungs at a great deal of risk when they run in areas with high concentration of PM2.5 and PM10 particulate levels. So we wanted to test which of these running surfaces produces the least particulate matter and is therefore the healthiest for these athletes. The first, the first running surface that we tested was polyurethane track versus standard track. The second surface that we tested was grass versus turf. 
And finally, we tested asphalt versus dirt versus concrete. In our experiment, we used a dilos meter. And to, uh, to collect the data, we set the dilos meter up one yard away from a running spot. And then we had the runner pass over the spot. And we collected the highest points and recorded them. So these are the results that we found. And um, the blue represents the baseline that, that was present before we tested with running. And the red represents how much uh, was present after. They are in micrograms per meter cubed. So the first that we tested was asphalt versus concrete versus dirt trail. Um, as you can tell, the dirt trail was far higher than either the concrete or the asphalt. And so this made us pose the question, is it worth it to run on dirt trails? And the answer we found is yes, because Stanford University, sorry, Stanford University conducted an experiment that found that areas of the brain that uh, control psychological aspects are greatly benefited from exercising in outdoors areas rather than in urban areas. And we found this was much more useful than the small amount of particulate matter that you inhale while uh, running and exercising in outdoor areas. Uh, back to the results. The second area that we tested was grass versus turf. So as you can tell, <laughs> sorry about that, they're not uh, a ton different. So we found there's not really a consensus we can come to there, nothing too much to change. But when we looked at the track materials, cinder track versus polyurethane track, there was staggeringly more particulate matter present in cinder track rather than polyurethane track. Oh, sorry. So we decided to zoom on in this a bit and found that even in PM10 levels, it was much higher in cinder track. Um, so, <laughs> so our conclusion, we supported, uh, our conclusion supported our hypothesis that the different running surfaces would produce significantly different PM2 and 5 and PM10 levels, especially relative to the polyurethane track and cinder track. So we found that we can apply this to life is that our high schools should supply polyurethane tracks rather than cinder tracks to their track athletes to improve their health for running. Um, so we found that a 13 millimeter polyurethane track does cost $360,000 to install, which may seem high, but in the first 12 years, it has no maintenance costs. This seems well worth it for our, the health of our athletes. So our primary sources of error would most likely come from one day, to, one day data collection, one person reading the data, and the runner's speed could have been inconsistent. So here are we're excited and, uh, well, maybe not. Uh, all right, that's all we got. Uh, is there any questions? Yes. OK, so you guys compared the different aspects of it. Did you compare the turf to the actual dirt trail? Why did you use the turf that you had a higher PM um, 2.5? Even though that it is a synthetic um, thing compared to dirt, which is pretty much just a particle. And stuff. So comparing dirt to which? To to turf, uh, the, the, uh, can we go back a few yeah. slides to the results? Mm -hmm. So the, the turf was actually much higher than the dirt trail. Um, I'm not sure on why that is, but it is. Um, yeah, I guess that's all I got for that. But um, if you guys, <laughs> sorry, the dirt trail versus like the polyurethane, I can see how that doesn't produce much because it's really, there's nothing much for, to come up out of the polyurethane, whereas the stuff like dirt and turf has uh, stuff that can be kicked up and loosened and put into the air. Uh, anyone else? <coughs> oh, sorry. Oh, yes. We did, we did, we did only do one of each uh, material type, but we did them in the same day over like the, a course of about two hours between all of them. They were all taken, so. But yes, we, we did only do one of each. Anyone else? Yes. I'm a little confused on how you collected the sample. Was it just someone standing still while people ran by? Oh, sorry. So we, um, we had the dilos meter that we placed one yard from a spot that we had a uh, uh, single runner run past, and then uh, just measured the peak levels that were that yielded from like him running past the dilos meter. And they were all about okay. everybody. Yeah. Sorry. OK, yeah, no worries, no worries. Anyone else? All right, well, thank you for listening. That's all we got. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Um, my name is Noah Whitehorn. This is my partner, Ethan, Ethan Davidson. And unfortunately, our partner, Hayden Tillinger, couldn't be here. But we tested carbon monoxide emissions from uh, several Ford trucks. All right. So a couple uh, pieces of background information for you. Uh, carbon monoxide, as most of you already know, is 
Uh, uh, there's no, it's an odorless, toxic gas that can often result in the deaths of those uh, exposed to it for long periods of time. Um, if it isn't monitored, um, people will experience uh, nausea, loss of consciousness, and con uh, consciousness, excuse me, and even death, as I've stated. Um, before the Clean Air Act was passed in 1990, uh, two thirds of all carbon emissions came from transportation sources like cars, planes, uh, trucks, etc., and more than 90 percent came from uh, the urban areas. Right. So we hypothesized that uh, if we tested uh, six Ford F-350 trucks. Um, which is a similar model and uh, just uh, different dates. I believe it was 2004, 2011, 2017, and 2014. Uh, I can't remember quite what the other one was. Uh, we have realized that the older trucks would produce more carbon monoxide emissions. All right, so just some simple materials. We used a carbon monoxide detector. Uh, we had a journal for recording any abnormalities uh, when we, uh, you know, were taking the data. Uh, we tested six, four trucks of similar model, and, but different years, and uh, we just used a computer with a uh, carbon monoxide data collection software. All right, so the cars used were uh, 2005 F250, uh, 2003 F350, 2008 F350, uh, 2014 F350, 2011 F350, and 2017 F350. And so our procedure, we. Uh, we got a CO monitor checked out from our teacher's classroom. Uh, we assembled our team at uh, Helma Motors, our local uh, car dealership. We held the carbon monoxide meter uh, next to the exhaust pipe for about two minutes. Um, we repeated uh, step three again for each of the six trucks. Um, we made note of any abnormalities while we were collecting the data. Uh, that. We returned the uh, carbon monoxide detector and gathered all the results in a spreadsheet, fairly standard. All right, so. All right. So here was the, uh, the initial graph that we created, basically fresh from our carbon monoxide detector. Um, as you can see, there, we have time in 24-hour format on the x-axis. On the y-axis, we have the carbon monoxide concentration in parts per million. Uh, each spike on this graph basically represents one car that we tested while it was running. Um, and then after that, we were able to create this bar graph um, corresponding each spike to its um, corresponding year of truck. Um, so as you can see, it's there isn't really an obvious correlation between the uh, year of the truck and the amount of carbon dioxide that it was emitting over the two minute periods. Um, so our hypothesis that it would, the amount of carbon dioxide would decrease as the year of the car increased was struck down. Um, so why is this? Well, it could be that perhaps we're just, as a country, not doing enough to um, make our cars more eco-friendly, you know? This no correlation doesn't really support um, the claims made by our country that, you know, we're, we're making efforts to, to do this. Um, some sources of error that could have occurred during our experiment. Um, maybe just some cars are more driven than others, um, which would have worn down the parts and uh, perhaps it'll release a lot more carbon, carbon monoxide to be released. Um, perhaps there were some errors in the CO meter. Our teacher reported that the students that had used the carbon monoxide detector previously had um, been experiencing some issues with it turning on and then turning off at certain at other intervals. So that's certainly a possibility. Um, and we could have also been inconsistent in the distance that we held the carbon monoxide detector from the tailpipe of the car while it was running. Um, so for next time, we would definitely have our carbon monoxide meter take more frequent readings because as it was, it was only taking two every minute, which probably did not make our results that accurate. Um, in the future, we could also keep track of our exact times, like when we exactly when we started taking our readings and exactly when we ended taking our readings. So we knew which, what data we needed to use specifically. Um, we could also do extra tests, testing more trucks with the same years 
or even different years, we could try for new cars to make sure that the parts are as fresh as possible, and maybe even test different mates like Hyundai, Nissan, or Toyota. Um, and certainly as a country, like I said earlier, we need to make a larger effort if we are to believe this, this data we, that we have collected. I believe that we should that we should work towards a negative correlation in this data so that as, as we hypothesized earlier, as the year increases, the amount of carbon dioxide decreases. And as we do this, we will prepare a better future for ourselves and our posterity. Any questions? Yes, you. I'm sorry, can you repeat that? Well, um, I'm not an I am not an expert on cars, but um, I do think that um, other factors like that definitely would have played a role in. Um, and the results of our experiment, however, we did make every effort to um, control as much of our experiment as possible. But yes, you are, I think that you would be correct. Other questions? Uh, yes. Uh, most definitely. Um, I'd say that depending on the type of uh, fuel it uses and probably the type of engine it has, it could definitely vary on the amount of carbon dioxide emissions that it does produce. Also, um, just as a side note, um, one of our cars was a, what was an F-250, um, and the reason that we did that was due to the supplies that we had, and um, we included it because the only difference was in the car was Basically, this is the suspension in the car, which we can see as a um, game changer for our experiment. Yes? Consider the mileage of the vehicle. Yes, that is, that's also, that is also a possibility for a source of error. Um, like I mentioned earlier, uh, cars that were used more um, than others definitely would have um, experienced um, decreased quality of, of parts. So if one car had more mileage than another, could have been driven more, I, I do think that um, that would have affected possibly the amount of carbon monoxide that it was giving off. Uh, no, the car was uh, idling. We just turned on the, started the ignition. We just let it sit there while we took the data. All right. Thank you. Okay. Great job. Okay. For now is our poster session. So what uh, what we're going to do is anybody that has a poster, please go outside and stand by your poster. And you're going to be evaluated by some judges. I encourage everybody else to go out there and look at posters. We will be back in here at 11.40, okay? 11.40. All right, hi. So I'm Kaylee Hoff, and this is Carly Lawson, and we're from Hoskins High School in the environmental science class of our teacher is Dave Eagle. And we're going to see small things that matter in two different community places of Hoskins. The process is we tested a small, well, I guess I in the Science Hotel and Hot Springs High School's old gym. So on March 27th, we put the dialysis machine in the old gym in the concession stand of the lobby. And we collected data for the next 24 hours. And on April 21st, we put the dialysis machine in the Science Hotel lobby and collected data for the next 24 hours. And this is the model of the dialysis machine we used. So just a little bit of background information that could play into the results of the experiment where the Science Hotel was built in 1929 and has four pools outside of temperatures 88 degrees Fahrenheit, 92 degrees Fahrenheit, 104 degrees Fahrenheit, and 109 degrees Fahrenheit. And um, it attracts many tourists quite often. The lobby isn't um, very clean. It's not very well dusted. And there's people constantly going in and out the front door. 
the Hot Springs High School gym was built in the early 1930s. A lot of different activities such as PE, drama, junior high sports, and concerts take place in there. And the concession stand, which the dialysis machine was placed in, is pretty confined. We hypothesized that the level of small particulate matter would be high, higher in the science hotel than in the old gym due to the humidity given off from the pools and natural minerals in the atmosphere and more dust in the air. We think that this is going to happen because since particulate matter is in the air from tiny solid particles and liquid droplets in the air, and it contains acids such as nitrates and sulfates, and the science hotel has higher levels of that than the old gym does. And particulate matter can affect your health such as eye irritation, sore throat, and breathing trouble. So this is a graph of the particulate matter level in the old gym in a 24-hour period. The increment of time measured in seconds, each gap is one. Um, let's see. Um, the high level high levels during the day went down towards the evening. That was fine. So our conclusion is that the level of small particulate matter is much higher in the science hotel due to um, a lot more dust in the air. And there's the old gym concession stand is more closed in, so it's not um, subjected to so much activity as the science hotel is. Okay, I think we skipped a graph. This one, um, the highest point is a little greater than 4.0 particulate matter micrograms per cubic meter around the 11 p.m. And we think that the reason for the spike was because of PE classes coming in for the gym, for elementary. But other than that, it stays pretty even, pretty constant. And then this was, I guess, in the lobby for Sags Hotel. And what happened is that it was placed near the door and there was a lot of activity more in the morning because we think many people were coming in to, you know, I guess get a room. <laughs> but that was, that was it. Yeah, thank you. There's like a lot of people and a lot of like out of towners there because it's just kind of a historic place. And then the old gym is just something that we've been in every day in school, like since we were in kindergarten. And so it was just kind of, and it's pretty old too, so we thought maybe that might play into it. Any other questions? Thank you. Hey guys, my name is Kyle, this is Shanoa, and that's Johnny. Uh, we're going to be talking about particulate matter in higher population areas within Missoula, and if everyone's ready, we're going to be starting off. Okay. All right, so to begin, 
To begin, uh, the presentation I'm going to provide some general background information about the correlation between pollution and population. Uh, NASA's research team conducted a study in 2013 to find different pollution rates in uh, different areas based on population. And one of the factors is uh, industrial development, like factories and geographic differences. And surprisingly, some of the areas with smaller population had a higher pollution ratings due to the listed outside forces. Uh, two other sources also explained a large jump, jump in population over the past couple hundred years, multiplying uh, initial population of 1 billion in the 1800s to 6 billion by early 2000s. Uh, the BBC stated that as a result, the amount of waste and pollution is also on the rise. Uh, because of that research, we decided our hypothesis as population would increase, we thought that the pollution levels or the particulate matter in the air, which in this case was PM10, would also increase alongside it. So, yeah. So, there's. Is this here? Okay. So, some things to note are uh, the data will be interpreted in PPM. And uh, it was. Kyle, didn't you go over this? Did you not do this? Uh. <laughs> One second. Lolo has a population of. 38,892 uh, in 2010, and Missoula has much more than that at 69,821 in 2014, and measurements will be given on an hourly basis on a given day. Uh, so our methodology is first we obtain the Dylos air quality monitor, second plug in the Dylos in the respective testing sites, Missoula and Lolo, then uh, obtain the data for a period of 24 hours, and then finally transcribe data onto a table for interpretation. This is the table that is the data is on for interpretation, and uh, I think our monitor was overly sensitive because these are ridiculous readings, but. Um, that's the data for Zula, December in Missoula and Lolo, and it's small slash large parts per million of PM10. And this is the data for the second half of the day in Missoula and Lolo in December, and that is the data put into a graph with spikes, which was error in the testing environment, and this is for a day in March in Missoula and Lolo on the second half of the day, and another graph of the data. It's a considerably larger spike. So if you look at the graphs during the time periods, you can see a certain spike around the time where you would see or normally see traffic. So uh, for example, when you look at Lolo around uh, the six, uh, four or five, which is normally traffic, you see a small increase. While in Missoula, there is a larger increase. And we could actually correlate this to the amount of traffic going through because a, a large amount of people are going home from work at that time during the day. So the parts per million would actually increase because of that as a result of the higher traffic. And so uh, to conclude, we actually, uh, our hypothesis was actually disproven by the data that we received. If we go back to low load, uh, uh, that's so if you look at Lolo during this time, there's a, a small increase over that, and we can't actually prove our hypothesis because of this. So with that, we see our hypothesis was somewhat disproven because of that, and the high, uh, high amount of uh, excuse me, the high amount of particulate matter we could correlate to a number of things, but the higher rate of uh, particulate matter in Lolo. Uh, could be due to a number of things. For example, fire uh, people use wooden stoves in Lolo because uh, there's no regulation against that there. There's also a higher amount of traffic and faster traffic because it's just off the highway, which is also heavily used. So our hypothesis was disproven or uh, not supported by our research. Next one. And so uh, it's a little bit important to note these things uh, when you're in these areas because taking these things into consideration for someone like myself who's an asthmatic, 
uh, understanding why the air quality is in such a way actually helps you prepare for the day and helps you understand why your breathing might be worse or better during that given day. So, uh, with all of that, do you guys have any questions for us? Uh, right, so on both of them, uh, the air quality monitors were set outside of our house at a, a height of about this high, and they were just outside of our house too, so there wasn't much interference from wind because we had the housing blocking that. Not necessarily the city, but probably more around the house, uh, the area around the house. So Johnny, for example, where his was placed is in a pretty heavily populated area because he lives in a trailer park. So there's quite a few people that live around that area. And I also live in a pretty uh, densely populated area in Lolo. So that could be representative to the population in that area. Uh, I would say the traffic from Lolo is because it's just off of a highway, so there's a lot of traffic that's going pretty fast, and dust is definitely going to be coming off of it because of the high speed. Cameron. So approximately how far away from My house is just about a quarter of a mile, and Johnny's would be uh, significantly yeah. further. The closest one would be Reserve Street, which is probably about two miles away. Okay. Have you ever had uh, it's not necessarily worse unless it's a considerably higher value, which you would probably see during August when it's fire season. So this wasn't as high to trigger asthma, but it could be a contributory if you're going through like exercise or something. Thank you guys for your time. This is Ann Lort and this is Emma Noble. We are from Capitol High School and we were under the direction of Sarah Urban. And our experiment was how pets fur affects the PM 2.5 levels. Um, many of our questions run in the same category as we're looking at the health of a human and tying in allergies along with high PM levels. Hopefully impacting the future of pet selection as maybe if somebody is choosing a future pet and they have a problem with asthma, they could possibly pick a single dog instead of four cats. Okay, so the type of pets we had, in house one, there's one dog and it's an Airedale. In house two, we have four cats. Um, two are Persians and then one is a black and white tuxedo cat and then the last one is a Lynx Point Siamese. And then in house three, we have one golden retriever yellow Labrador mix. In house four, we have two cats. One is a long-haired mixed breed, and then the other one is a short-haired calico. And in house five, we have five dogs, a German shepherd, three pit bull mixes, and an Irish setter mix. Our hypothesis is mainly about the idea of if a house with a cat would have a higher PM level than a dog, a house with a dog, and we believe that due to the cat's shedding and the use of a kitty litter box rather than a dog going to the bathroom outside. Um, we also had the hypothesis that a house with a higher quantity of pets will have a higher PM level rather than a house with a smaller amount of the same pet, which is kind of obvious. So our procedure was to gather the materials. Our materials include PM dialos, paper and pencil, the houses and the animals, the computer to download the data to, and the, clean, and the cleaning materials. We repeated these steps for each of the rooms, a living room, a bedroom with the animals that are constantly in it, and a bedroom that the animals are not constantly in. We started by cleaning all the rooms, vacuuming, dusting, trying to limit the amount that was already existing. Then we'd open up windows and doors so that most of the cleaning fumes and dust risen from vacuuming would be released. And then we let the animals back in, closed all the windows and doors, let them hang out and do their normal thing for about an hour. Then we'd set the particular matter collector inside one of the rooms that had been recently cleaned and had to collect the data continuously for about two hours. 
After about two hours, we crunched all the data that we collected and compared the variables of all of our data. So this is uh, the graph that shows um, the main process of our evaluation. Um, as you can see, we tested six rooms. We tested a large living area, a small living area, a small common area, a small uncommon area, a large common area, and a large uncommon area. We are going to use a simpler graph layout as this is kind of complicated to read. Um, on the left are pets, pets such as like dogs, and then on the right are pets with such as cats. Um, you can see the difference that all the data had a difference between the common and uncommon, uncommon rooms. And if you notice with the top right house, that's house two with four cats, it actually, the y-axis goes up to 10,000. And if you look at the um, y-axis for the other ones, they don't go up that high. And same with the one below it that had two cats, it goes up to 600, while the house next to it, house three, only goes up to 400. Um, we showed that you can obviously see amount, the amount of hair can cause an unsteadiness in PM level. We had a blown up version of the house five, which had five dogs in it. As you can obviously see the difference between the small uncommon room and the small common room, as the red is the small common, uncommon, no, the small common room, and the blue is the small uncommon room. Okay, so our overall results, we took the common room and subtracted the uncommon room and got these results. The house with the more pets has more unstable data, which means that more pets means more particulate matter, and more particulate matter is bad for human health. So, in conclusion, our data proves our hypothesis correct. There was more particulate matter in the houses with more pets, and there was more in the houses with cats rather than dogs, and the room that did have pets uncommonly in also did cause the data to be less than the room with pets commonly in. So, our sources of error, so obviously all experiments have error within their designs and procedures. Our experiment had many errors. One was possible contamination, such as like human interaction, like walking around, cooking. Um, the, all the houses we tested had different layouts, different room sizes. We did not test a house that had only one cat, nor did we test a house that had only had an outdoor cat. And at one point, all of our tests that we had taken got erased, so we had to redo it and change up our procedure a bit. And we didn't test a house that had absolutely no animals at all. We did, but we lost it. Um, our main recommendations would be changing the house's room sizes so they would be more similar and their pet owner's routine, which can be random at times as some people can change the way that they can clean the cat's litter box or how, money, how much they brush their cat. If we had time, we would also have tested around four hours instead of two. Plus, if we had enough dialoses, we would have all had, you know, three dialoses and put them in the separate rooms and then tested at the exact same time so that the time wouldn't have been an issue. This is our references. And these are our pets. <laughs> Any questions? Ben Carrasco, and this is my partner, Drew Slimgen, and we are students uh, in Corvallis. We're taking chemistry right now, and our teacher is Mr. Hamill. Uh, so, our experiment involves wood with bark and with, without bark, and seeing how it uh, affects air quality. But first, before I get that, I'm just going to give you guys a little bit of background on how we came to this experiment and how it kind of, how we thought of it. So every year, Drew and I, we live in the valley, so we have a lot of people, including us, use wood stoves as primary sources of heat in the winter times. So every year around fall, we get these big loads of wood that we have to stack um, that we get from the wood lumber yard just north of Victor. So uh, in the recent years, the wood that we've received from these lumber yards each fall 
That's kind of different. Some of the times the wood has bark, and some of the times the wood is debarked, and there's no bark on the wood whatsoever. So that kind of started the idea of what, when you're burning it, what one, which, which type of wood makes air quality worse. And so does burning wood with bark or without bark increase the particulate matter? Which one? Okay. So this is my stove. And there's our Dallas meter. We got some, some nice angles of my stove. Uh, this is the wood. As you can see, the one on the left is the one without bark, and the one on the right is the one with bark. Uh, we use six pieces of wood in our experiment, six of each, and they are the same type of wood. We check. They're both lodgepole pine. Lodgepole pine, sorry. Okay, so our experiment. So what we did is we placed the dialos meter five feet away from the stove door. We started it, and then first we burned six pieces of debarked wood over the course of 60 minutes. We didn't add a piece of wood every five or 10 minutes. We just added it whenever it looked like it needed it because just on a normal day, we're not going to be like, oh, it's five minutes. We've got, we've got to add more wood to the fire. Um, so we tried to be a little, little, little bit more um, like you do on a normal basis. So what we did is we let the monitor do its thing. And then we let the fire go out and waited 12 hours before our next trial. Then on the next trial, we did the exact same thing, except we burned wood with bark over the course. The first one was without. The, first, the second one is with bark over the course of 60 minutes, monitoring, monitoring TM 2.5 levels. And then we recorded our data. So our hypothesis, um, our hypothesis was wood with bark is going to make PM, le PM levels in the house worse. Um, this is because the wood is damp and it smokes more. And usually, if the wood is damp or it contains moisture, it doesn't burn as well. So that's why we assumed that the wood with bark would be worse for air quality. So I'm going to turn it over to my partner. OK, so as you can see, this is our wood without bark. And the y-axis only goes up till to like 3.5, which is not very high at all compared to the 35 standard for um, the micrograms per meter cube. And it stays pretty level. It's pretty consistent. Nothing crazy here. Now, the wood with bark, as we can see, the y-axis is much higher than the wood without bark. It goes up to 16, and the, the line almost hits 14, which is, once again, it's below the 35 uh, unhealthy level. But it's still pretty significant considering we're indoors. And now, the Initial spike, I would assume, is from when the bark is initially burning off and producing more smoke, therefore more particulate matter. And it kind of just evenly evens out, and it's pretty normal. Um, yep. So analyzing our data. After our graphs, um, after we analyzed our graphs, we averaged out the data, and we came to the conclusion that the wood without bark creates an average of 2.34 micrograms per meter cube particulate matter. This is not very high. And then the wood with bark creates an average of 3.26 micrograms per meter cube of particulate matter. And these results clearly show that there's a difference between the wood with bark and the wood without. The wood with bark producing one, about one more um, of particulate matter. So some of our results, our findings show that burning wood with bark will make the air quality near the stove in your house slightly worse than air quality than, um, than burning wood without bark. Neither of these wood types create unhealthy air quality within one hour, but if you were to burn wood over the course of an entire day when it's necessary and it's cold, um, these levels could possibly reach higher, higher levels. So solution. So if you sleep near a wood stove, you are at a, a higher risk of, um, you know, to get matter taking it to be five. So perhaps you, should, you could move your bed, sleep somewhere else, if you're really bothered by this, by those numbers. And if you want to completely get rid of your stove, um, there's alternate uh, sources you could heat your house with, such as propane, electric. There's different ways to do it. And it is important to note, once again, burning wood with bark or wood without bark does not create unhealthy air within your home over the course of only one hour. So revision to experiment. If we were to conduct, conduct this experiment again, we would scoop all the pre-existing ash from the stove to avoid any um, unnecessary ash getting into the dialysis monitor or inserting the wood into the stove. And then running a second trial would be beneficial, obviously, to increase um, your accuracy and results. 
as any, it would be in any science experiment. And we could have made each test longer, as I said earlier. We could have made it, you know, eight hours to see if it really stacked up the uh, particle on particular matter levels. And any questions? <coughs> right there, you. Uh, good idea. That's that's actually a really good idea. But uh, what we were thinking is we're just using day-to-day -day wood. We're not going to really do anything special with the wood. So we got the wood from the normal lumber yard, and we saw what happened. Uh, next question. All the way up there. <laughs> Um, we thought about that, but there, we decided against it because, once again, we aren't deciding exact measurements. We're just seeing which one makes it worse. So, yeah, that probably, we could have done that, but we decided against it. Next question. Yeah. Did you further look into how quadrifiers burn? Because, um, from my understanding, quadrifiers, they burn a lot slower, so they put off more smoke, or put off less smoke than, um, Say a bigger, like a bigger size stove. Well, we both had quadrifiers, and that's what we did our experiment on. So we definitely, if we could have gotten a different wood stove, it of course would have made our results much more precise. But we did not have more wood stoves. But were they like similar in size? Yeah, yeah. Quadrifiers vary in different sizes. Our stoves are very similar in size. <laughs> Uh, next question. <laughs> Can you repeat the question, please? Uh, do you ever have trouble breathing when you are burning it constantly, like in the winter time? Because you said it never like passed that, right? No, we. Uh, I don't have asthma or anything, and neither does Drew. So uh, we've never had an experience any problems breathing with our wood stove going. So what are we doing this experiment? We definitely, again, try to make sure it is as normal conditions as possible. So just the day-to-day -day burning of the wood in our house. So the stove door was closed. Does the volume change? Does the volume of the wood being different means not being have an effect on any data? Um, yeah, definitely, but like I've said, this is just a normal day-to-day -day wood, and we weren't going to try to chop down the wood that we had in my house from the lumber yard to get it exactly. But yeah, we, we definitely could have done that. Uh, got it? Oh, oh, wait, one more, sorry. So, in the normal business, would you always just use multiple eyes, or would you use those different different trees? No. We get lots of coal pine from the lumber yard. And that's all we got. <laughs> so, thank you. All right, good job, guys. So, I'm Lane Hansen, and this is my partner, Kelsey Mueller. We're from Sentinel High School, and we're taking Chemistry 2 under the direction of Mr. Taylor. Um, our question was different running surfaces and the effects of PM 2.5 on people's running exposure, I guess. <laughs> Oops. Maybe. Maybe. Our question that we wanted to answer was how different uh, levels, or how different running surfaces of impact a, a runner's exposure to PM 2.5. So then the goal of our experiment was just to determine pretty much the PM 2.5 levels based on varying, various different running surfaces. Um, we tested three different running surfaces, which was a dirt track, a concrete sidewalk, and then an indoor track. And so there's about 2,000 people that are runners and participate in races and other events in Missoula. Those aren't counting the ones that are just running recreational. And so we're trying to find out which one is more beneficial for runners to exercise at. We hypothesized that if we were to test on the dirt trail, Kim Williams, and the 
a concrete sidewalk on Dearborn Ave Avenue and the indoor track at the source, then the, uh, the Dearborn would have the highest values of uh, PM 2.5 followed by Tim Williams and then the source. And we said that because uh, there, we, in our research we found that there are connections between vehicle emissions and PM 2.5 levels. So then our project summary, we used the Dylos DC 1700 air quality monitor to do the experiment. And we put it in a baby carrier front pack and we ran on each of the three surfaces. Um, and so what we would do is we'd have a five minute baseline that we would just set the Dylos and we'd just stand there for a little bit and then we'd run for 10 minutes and then we'd also have a five minute baseline at the end of it. So we placed the Dylos vertically into the baby carrier. And yes, we did get some weird looks while doing this. And uh, we put the air intake vent facing out one of the leg holes and then the runner would put the arm through the other leg hole to like hold it stable while we ran. So it always had a, a good opening to the atmosphere. Okay, so trial date one was on March 16th and as you can see, it was pretty clear blue skies in the pictures down there. It was about 52 degrees. There was slight wind, but it wasn't too bad. And then there was no precipitation. And so the blue line is the Kim Williams dirt track. And then the source is the purplish line. And then the green line is Dearborn. And as you can see, the Kim Williams trail has a pretty significantly high blue spike compared to the other two surfaces. Trial date. Oh. Sorry, that's just a bigger <coughs> picture of it. <laughs> okay, trial date number two was on April 20th, and it was overcast in, in the upper 40s, and there was a lot less wind than on the first day, and there was no precipitation again. And the graph looks a little bit different this time, but as you can see, the, you can click it. Oh. the source was still really low like before, and then Dearborn and Kim Williams were both up there, but uh, overall, Kim Williams appears to have higher amounts of PM 2.5. And so we had to run this through the ANOVA test, the, the one-way ANOVA test to uh, prove that there was a statistical difference. And so we put all of the data from each pa pathway into its own column. And then we found the means, which is the yellow boxes. Those are the, just the averages from each column. And you can see that as we observed in the graphs that Dearborn has a, uh, or Kim Williams has higher PM 2.5 levels than Dearborn. And then the variance is the average amount of difference between values in a column versus its average of the column. And those are uh, pretty low. And then the p-value, which is in light blue, that is, uh, that proves that there is a statistical difference between our our data. So then possible errors that we could have come across. Um, the first day, March 16th, was slightly more windy, which could have caused more dust particles or just particles in general to move around. And then also the air quality monitor that we had in the baby carrier might not have had the most direct opening to the environment, which, I mean, we tried to make it so it was as efficient as possible, but it could have gotten moved around. So, in conclusion, we, our predictive hypothesis was a little bit off because we predicted the Dearborn would have the highest levels of PM 2.5 followed by Kim Williams and then the source, but it was actually uh, Kim Williams, then Dearborn, and then the source. So then we reject the null hypothesis because the p-value of the single factor ANOVA test was significantly lower than 0 0.05, which meant that there was a statistical difference between the three different running surfaces. And the reasons for uh, these, uh, the, our results is because Kim Williams has more of an impact in the dust in the dirt trail had, it, it's more, it has more of an impact than of uh, vehicle emissions on Dearborn. Here's our, we're excited. And any questions? In the red. Yeah. Uh, it could
could have, but they were, uh, each day that we tested on the was uh, calm days and so uh, with minimal wind, so we made sure that the atmosphere was like relatively similar in each place. Yeah? Uh, do you find that the uh, air quality is unhealthy or unhealthy or No, they weren't, none of them were unhealthy. We just wanted to compare within the three different surfaces. Yeah, you? What, what time of day? Oh, it was in the afternoon, probably from two to three on both of those days. What? Yeah. Any other questions? All right, so that's it for the presentation. So a wonderful job to the presenters. So let's give them a, one more round of applause. Presenter judges and our poster judges. So, Earl Adams, uh, Dr. Earl Adams from the chemistry department, will announce the, uh, the, the uh, present, uh, presentation judges. Sorry, uh, we just want to do a quick recognition of our judges before we break for lunch. Uh, our point judges, could you come on up? Uh, Mary French. Amy Sellenberg, Laurel Staples, Ben Schmidt, and Fernando Cardoza. Uh, let's thank them for their time. And effort. Thank you. Thank you. Really great presentations this year. Really good. Yeah. Thanks for all the good work. Okay, wait a minute. Can you guys line up for me? I'm going to get a quick picture. And then I'll let you Okay, you guys have to squish together because there we go. All right, one, two, three. Thank you. Okay, it looks like we've got them all. Am I holding this close enough to my mouth? I really don't like this microphone. So before we uh, get going with the awards, I'd like to thank our sponsors, Montana DEQ. Um, always donates money for this event. Uh, as you guys can probably imagine, between the things you're given and the lunch and all that, it um, costs money to put this on. So uh, the Montana Department of Environmental Quality is a huge help. And then our grant is funded by the National Institute of Health. They have a program called SEPA, Science Education Partnership Award. And without that award, we wouldn't be able to do this either. So um, we'd like to acknowledge our sponsors. And um, anything else on that note? Okay, we're good there. Uh, also, you guys are all so lucky um, because you have amazing teachers, and uh, I'm a teacher, and I work with all these teachers in this program and feel so honored to get to interact with such stellar science teachers. And I hope you guys thank them every day because they're incredibly dedicated and they do a lot for you. And uh, we'd like all our teachers who are here today to come down, the teachers who brought students. Is Holly Ferris still here? 
she would get an honorable mention. She's not here anymore, it doesn't look like. But can all the teachers who came with students come on down and join us up here in the front? Yes. Some of you know he's retiring this year, so an extra shout out to him. <laughs> Thank you. 
Foster, mapping of radon exposure at Libby Middle High School, Jacqueline Curl and Nicholas Tom from Libby. to the uh, PowerPoint Presentation Awards. Fourth place honorable mention from Capitol High School, how pets fur affects PM 2.5 levels. And Lure Emma Noble and Chloe Anderson, come on down. different running surfaces on a runner's exposure to PM2.5. Kelsey Mueller and Lane Hansen. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you.